Hey everybody, welcome to Office Hours 3, where it's November 1st for the Oregon State University Pro Course 2021. Uh, we're jumping right into questions. Nicole was just uh, talking about uh, that she answered her own questions and it takes time. Uh, she was talking about the different layers and I was just responding to Nicole that, yeah, it does. Um, it's, a, it's a wholly different way of working with and looking at landscape. And especially when we're trying to reference landscape in, in planes of field that we can move around or bring back on. It is, a, it is a different way of looking at landscape and it takes time. So uh, bravo, Nicole, for answering your own question. And at the same time, um, you're, you're developing a way of looking now with these types of tools that allow you to be, I think a little bit more self-referential. I don't know if that lands at all or if I'm just making up words, but. It does because, um, you know, I, I'm in the Piedmont, which is a bunch of plateaus, a bunch of, of ridges and valleys. And so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to picture myself where I am geographically in this state on like a larger context, but then I'm also on the site. So, you know, you're seeing even more of a microclimate, a smaller scale. And I think overall, when I was putting some of that together over the last few days, it was just, you know, in different places. Yeah, and it's it's granularity, you know, something that I came to when I uh, did some studying with Sepp Holzer and went over to Austria and saw the Kramaterhof and saw the Holzerhof, uh, which is his two farms, the Kramaterhof being the, you know, the super shiny one that everybody knows about. And then the Holzerhof, really interesting story behind that farm. Um, he thinks at a scale that most landscape designers don't. He thinks in watersheds. He thinks in valleys. He did a design in Spain and Monaco for the Princess of Monaco that basically transformed about 25 square kilometers because it had been denuded for almost six centuries and then brought all of that water back. And once the water was there, then he could go back into plants. And once the plants were there, we've got a functioning ecosystem again. So yeah, it's it's something that I'll talk about a little bit today uh, when we talk about should North be up, but we have an incredible illiteracy when it comes to landscapes. And we also suffer from something called landscape amnesia. We don't live outside. We live in these recycled air boxes with artificial light and we don't live on the landscape. And when that happens, we don't notice changes in the landscape. Like everyone's had this experience um, or has seen this experience with others where you're driving around town and someone's like, oh, that's never been there. I, I don't know where that came from. Ah, it wasn't there when I was a kid. Yet we don't have a similar conversation when it comes to landscape. We don't notice erosional changes. We don't notice fire changes. We don't notice season changes. and starting to move towards a relational experience where we're actively outside, we're actively observational is the other side of all of this data work, which in a remote remote course, that's part of it. And then the offset is, and this is why I still work for OSU and do this course is because it is so design focused. There's no other PDC on the planet that gives you a little bit of the design project, gives you feedback and then iterates and then iterates and then iterates. Mostly it's, it's all jammed at the end of the course and good luck. So it takes time. I really appreciate you taking the time to look at it and to process yourself and um, yeah, bravo. All right, so I wanna jump into the questions right away because we have a lot, which is fantastic. And I've got a couple of points to make first. And thanks so much, everybody, for showing up. So nice to see everybody. Um, thank you again for all the questions and conversations that have been coming in. Um, been really fantastic. I've been really enjoying the conversations with a lot of you. Uh, and thanks so much for everybody who reads the, um, the Zoom etiquette. So appreciate that too. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, uh, share to slide. So this is a, a, an order of operation, a logistic things for me that allows me to take less time getting to your slides and more time giving you feedback. Because of the way this program works, I have a certain set amount of time to work on your work. And if I can give you feedback, that's great. So basically, wherever you are in your slide, if this is, let's say, the first slide in the series of assignments for that week, all you do is just click up on top, copy this link and then paste that link for me. That gives me the ability to go directly to the slide that we're starting with and to move forward. Huge help for me. Um, almost without exception, blue is for water, green is for vegetation. 
I have a small exception if you're working in microclimates and you want to acknowledge that one of your microclimates is moist or wet and you want to do it in a light blue or a dark blue or a purple or whatever. Um, greed, I have very little exception for. Um, and the reason is this, as a designer, you have to work with not just convention with other professionals you work with, landscape architects, civil engineers, et cetera. You also have to work with your clients who generally speaking have a certain way of looking at the world. And generally blue is water, green is vegetation. So what I love about this course is, is I get to impart exactly where your type of work is going to interface well with client. And if the client is multi-stakeholders, it sometimes works if you're working with parks or with big corporations, you just wanna have the highest amount of literacy possible, the highest amount of integration possible. So um, I'll call this out every single time. Um, and no, again, when I'm calling these pieces out, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, if you would like to have the highest degree of iteration and the highest degree of, of uh, literacy, um, that's where it is. Um, bolded highlighting. So this is something I came across when I was working with uh, an incredible landscape designer and they did it all the time in their work. And what they did is they basically pulled out the highlighted materials because blocks of text, our brains kind of move over it. So this is a great example from Nicole where it's just bolding out the specifics, house with attached garage, replace wire fence with privacy fence, install a permeable parking lot. It just allows you to quickly pick it up. And funny enough, it came from the comic book industry. So. Uh, fantastic. I love, I love seeing this. What I would do generally is I would continue this on through the entire assignments. And whenever there's, uh, you know, bolded completely, I would debold and then go back to bolded highlighting. And especially when we get to our SWOT analysis, this is a great opportunity. And I loved how Nicole did this, just pulling out um, the, the high level order of operation. I came to SWOT analysis years ago when I was working with clients and they needed to understand my work. They needed to get a sense of my internal process. So if you're ever in the public school system and especially in mathematics or any of the STEM, it was show your work. This is us showing our work. Sometimes, and uh, I usually start to get frustrated student comments about this point uh, where people are saying, oh, I'm getting the same answers. That's the point. The point is, is to take every lens of every assignment, put it over your site and say, okay, well, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities? And what are the threats? We're basically sieving through this site through multiple SWOT analysis underneath the lens of each assignment to get a sense of, okay, am I reading the landscape correctly? This was a wonderful subholterism. Uh, the book of nature is always open. And when, when, not if we read it wrong, we can always go back to read it again. And this is one of these ways of helping you to really look through your site and get a sense of it over and over and over again. But I will say this, <clears throat> you want to look through your site through the lens of that assignment. So this is another good example where Nicole took specifically the base map. And so if you look at her base map, get a sense of it, you're seeing elements of it. When she gets to strengths, good sunlight, right? We can actually see this here. We can see what this is, especially because north is up. The moment you start to alter the compass rows is the moment we have compounding errors. Most of us don't have a ready understanding that south is where our most powerful sun comes from, west our second most powerful, east our third, and north our fourth, our fourth most powerful. And so it's important, at least from my experience, to really keep north up. That said, if it, for whatever reason, you make the decision to alter your compass row so that way you have more real estate on your slide. Fantastic. Just know that it compounds some of the errors that can come up with this. And I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more because there was another example of that lower down. Uh, I wanted to bring up another base map example. Richard did a brilliant job here. And I believe Richard used Adobe, which he had previous experience in. We actually recently got a, a very angry email from a student who, regardless of the fact that the landing page doesn't say any of this, he felt like this was going to be a rendering course and he was going to get full rendering skills uh, within this course. That's not the case. This is a course about design and design processing and how to look at a landscape. You will spend weeks, months, years building your rendering skills or like some of us do, and I'm, I'm definitely this, I hire out my rendering. I do basic drawings, basic designs, and then depending on the level of delivery, if I'm delivering to an architectural firm, I'll hire an AutoCAD. 
if I'm delivering to a client, but it's a high level client, it's a large scale, I'll probably hire one of, the, one of the four illustrators I work with. If it's a client with whom I know has a higher level of DIY and is interested in doing it, I'll usually just do everything on Google Earth Pro because it's easy to read, it's transferable, I can send them files, they can send me files. Um, I would love if Google Earth Pro ever brought in the multi-factor access of uh, Google editing, multi, multi-user editing to Google Earth Pro, but I think due to the way it's coded, it's never gonna happen. There's a couple of things I wanted to point out about Richard's map. One, it's very clear to read. You're looking at it, you're seeing the elements of it. Uh, it there's very little to get confused by. The second was he didn't put in his units for his contour, so I pointed that out always have to put your units for any measurements you put on your map. The third thing he did, and we'll get there eventually, if you ever want to skip ahead, go to the water survey map in it is there, there's a reference video called water flows at right angle to contour. And we've got some contour questions today, which I'll go into. But basically, water always flows at right angle to contour. So if we take a look at this, his original map, I'm going to pull up an arrow here. His original map had an arrow that did something like this. Oh, let's try this one more time. No, draw. There we go. His original map had something like this. I'm just going to make this a little bit thicker so that way it's a little bit more pronounced. And by a little, I mean a lot. So he had an arrow like this. Now, is that generally correct? Sure, that's generally correct. But because this is a course about teaching. If you take a look at this, this um, contour, and I'm gonna draw out this contour just because it's gonna be a little bit easier to see here. And, uh, reduce line thickness. So here's our contour here. And if we go back to our arrow tool, when we're building and understanding water flow, water's gonna flow at right angle to this contour. That means you're gonna have places where water flows and concentrates, which is uh, technically called a valley. We're gonna have places where water is dispersed, which we call a ridge. When I come into a landscape, I will take and draw out the specific ridge that I'm seeing here. And there was a little wobble in my, in my hand as I was doing this on my mouse. So here's our ridge and then here's our valley. Something like this. What does this mean? This means that in this area, and then he has a road here, which can also be a ridge. And conferring with Richard, I found out that it is indeed a ridge. That means we actually have one, two, three, four roof structures, if you will. You can think of this as the ridge line of a roof, and it's coming down into a valley. And what Richard has said is that there's a little valley right beside this because there's a ditch right beside this here. And then we have another two areas here. So PA Yeomans who created a uh, key line design, which is not just plowing and it's not just layout. He would take all of his materials and we've already used orange. We're not gonna do that. Let's go purple. He would take the ridges and the valleys and then he would separate everything into what he called land units. And the reason being is that this land unit is going to drain directly into this drainage. Similarly, this land unit is going to drain into this drainage. So we have one, we have two, we have three here. And you could argue, depending on how these roads work, that there might be more land units here. Here's three, and then we have four. This is not required in this course, but if you wanna get a jump on this type of work, I would recommend when you get into the rainwater harvesting and the site flow to do this type of analysis. Take your ridges, take your valleys. Javin, I don't have contours. Got it, cool. Walk the land and start to put flow arrows on the landscape and you can uh, interpret where, where these types of ridges and flows are. So again, if we take um, the idea that one meter squared times one millimeter of rain, equals one liter of water. We can take the square meterage of this plus the annual precip, and we get to the total amount of rainfall that falls on each one of these sites. And because of the way the land is shaped, we know that the rain that falls on this side of the landscape is not gonna go this way or this way or this way. So we'll eventually get there, but I wanted to bring this up 
um, a little bit early because it'll help with uh, a number of your interpretations as you're going through the different elements here. Uh, Akadina did an amazing drawn, um, hand-drawn design, which was fantastic. Again, I said this in the very first tutorial, I recommend drawing first. Um, digital design has a whole other level of conversation to it. So feel free to, um, to go back to drawn if you want to. And the last thing I'll say is that there's a couple of folks who didn't want to put in inspirational photos into the client survey. And I'll say this, there will always forever be a time in my design career where it was before I started asking clients to create um, desire boards through things like Pinterest and House and after. The more information a client can give me about what they're thinking and what they're looking at, what they're interested about, the more I can start to integrate that into the design myself. So in every single design that I'm working with, uh, that has to do with any sort of aesthetic feature, I'll send clients to either House or Pinterest and say, start to collect photos of what you're excited by. I need to start seeing what the aesthetic is. The reason for that is beautiful designs get maintained. If it's a beautiful design, it gets maintained. If it's not a beautiful design, it doesn't get maintained. This is uh, a truism that I've come to time and time again, and uh, it's a really important piece to keep in mind. So with that, I'm going to pop into the questions. Uh, Mariana, when doing the sector analysis compass, should I use my base map facing north to better understand it better? Due to the limitations of my design site, a very long narrow building, I had moved it northeast to be able to fit more detail on the drawing and be more specific. If I do use north facing, it's okay to only leave the drawing and remove the wording so it looks a little neater. So a couple of my answers, one, it's advisable to always use North is up when you start working with other professionals with the exception of sometimes in the Southern Hemisphere convention is that North is up. Use detailed drawings to expose and call more attention to certain areas. We just talked about solar literacy um, a little bit uh, at the beginning of the conversation. Most of us don't get the fact that the sun is where we get most, if not all of our energy, depending on who you speak to. Um, without that sun, without the gravitational forces that built our solar system, we wouldn't have any energy, including geothermal. The amazing balance of our orbits to the sun is why we have life on this planet and it's why we have any energy, be it wind, be it geothermal, be it, um, be it uh, solar, be it oil, be it uh, petroleum. Uh, all of that is based upon the pressures, the planetary pressures that were created because of the formation of our, our planet. So this idea of being very aware of the sun and being very curious about it is important. And I'll give you an example. Years ago, I was teaching a PDC on uh, the west coast of uh, British Columbia. At the same time, I was hosting an amazing uh, mycologist. Mycologist is uh, a fungal expert, Peter McCoy, who wrote an amazing book called Radical Mycology and has an incredible number of online courses about fungi if you're interested. I was hosting him for a fungi cultivation course. And I told a bunch of my students from the PDC that it was happening. They're like, well, we want to come. So they came uh, as well. And so I was seeing them through the week. And then on the weekend, I was hosting this workshop. So they came. It was a group of about 25, 30 people. And they were all around us. And we were creating a mushroom bed. So basically, we were doing chipped alder, um, uh, mycelial spawn, and then chipped alder, and then a little bit of straw on top, basically to help um, create this bed so that way the mycelium could then move throughout the wood chips. The mycelium is, is actually the entire body of fungi. We think of it as the roots of fungi, but it's actually the entire body. It makes up all those little white threads, the hyphal threads that there are. And actually mushrooms are actually condensed versions of mycelium. They actually, the threads come together to create the fruiting bodies we see and the caps. So we're sitting there and I ask everybody, why did we choose this site? for the bed and everybody in the course saved my students look down and my students look up and it was a testament to to their own learning that they had grokked at this point that when we are planning anything we're looking up first where is the sun what is the shading aspect what is the amount of exposure with a mushroom bed we want very little exposure we want a little but not much and we don't want it to dry out so we we, we chose a shaded experience or a shaded place within uh, this urban environment that had a little bit of exposure, had good air drainage, and would allow to uh, allow this mushroom bed to grow. Um, 
Finally, that said, if you feel you'll get more out of the course by changing the orientation of the map to increase the amount of space you have to work with, that is fine. You are uh, the uh, beginning and end of all of the conversation of this course. If it makes best sense, oh, I already had this up, um, then go to. So uh, La, uh, Mariana has a great site. She basically has all of these rooftops over in Queens in New York. And she originally, and this happens, especially with Google Earth, she had, you can see here, that there was um, some perspective shift on the photo. And because of that, she had drawn in the, rent, the, the perspective render. So she had these lines that were showing um, a perspective on this. And again, plan views, base maps, we want a top-down view only. And so we've got rooftops, we've got balconies, we've got front yards. And basically, um, the majority of this is all gravel. So she's, she's working mostly in beds or she's going to be working mostly in creating beds. And her question was, should she do something like this where the base map is like this or should she do something like this? Completely up to you, whatever you're comfortable with. If this were mine, I would go with it like this. And the reason being is that if we start thinking about heights of trees, if, if she wants to do pop culture trees, which she absolutely can do, um, we're going to want to think about shading and overshading. So let's say we do um, uh, some kind of pot culture where we have fruit trees up like this. We're going to be thinking about shading. And so we're probably going to be doing a cross section that allows us to see where the sun angle comes from. Or even if we're doing um, tomatoes, um, we might start to think like this. So Usually I will do it this way, even if we end up with a design that is uh, rectilinear. So say all we're doing is, oh, we're just gonna maximize space and we're just gonna do it like this. These are our rows and we're doing all soil and in beds or wicking beds. That's great. So normally I would do it like this, but if it helps for this course and you, you wanna do it um, in, this, in this fashion, totally fine. And this is great as well, because she's really shown us where is the access to these roofs. Um, how does she get up to them? Where's the no access areas? Um, where are the gutters? So there's a number of gutters in here. Again, great job on this work. I really appreciated the level of detail she put into this. Uh, any advice who I should reach out to the city to get architectural drawings of my building? So normally I'll reach out to um, the development department or if they have a civil engineering department, civil civil engineering or if nobody's talking to me i'll go to records and the reason for records is supposedly and it's not always the case sometimes they slip through but especially in cities you're supposed to file your drawings so i would reach out to to those folks um and i might even reach out to other architects and just ask them you know if you if i'm looking for these drawings where would i go question two robin do you use GIS? Uh, are there any permaculture designers using it? Yep, I do. Uh, and there's a few ways to use it. So I start any conversation about this with George E. Boxes, who's a statistician from the UK. All models are wrong and some are useful. Inherently, our base maps have a certain level of quote unquote wrongness or error. If we go back to any of these, uh, this is a representation of a site. It's not the entire site. This gives us um, a bunch of information but it's not all the information. It's important to recognize that because as we get into further and further designs, there's this belief, there's this myth that high grade topographical maps are exactly what the site is. And some designers, and I think wrongly, even go to the point of saying, uh, contour lines are the language of the landscape. I, I think that's a very reductionist viewpoint. I think that's a very engineered idea. What we're trying to do is take in information and in terms of geographical information systems, we're trying to take this information through a conceptualized framework that captures real world data out in the world, putting it through a process that creates a data model and then outputting that model into something we can read and we confer with each other. And there is always, always a level of error to it. So in 2000, the Shuttle Radar Topographic Mission, SRTM, uh, that NASA put up in, uh, with the shuttle, they basically did LIDAR, light image detection and, and radar, uh, uh, light detection, light imaging detection and radar. 
And what they did is they shot lasers down to the planet. And in terms of their speed and their frequency bouncing back, they got an accurate reading of what the planet was. But each pixel that they captured was 30 meters, which means if your site has any differentiation between 30 meters on the elevational axis, what's called the Z axis, then the computer did the very scientific work of interpolating, also called guessing, what was inside of that topography. This means that all of the public source data in the world, and this includes Google Earth, is that data. That data has an error of about 15 meters, um, can have up to an error of deviation on 50 meters on the Z and two to five meters on the X and Y. Does that mean we shouldn't use it? No, but it means that we should be relatively aware of that error and we should plan accordingly. It means that once we have data about the site, we should always be ground truthing, going to the site itself and laying out and figuring out how things lay out on site. It doesn't matter if I've spent, I just did a, a survey with a client where I brought on an RTK real-time kinetic ground station and um, receiver walked the majority of the property that was treed, got a number of data points that was accurate down to sub centimeter, which is pretty accurate. Then I put a bunch of what's called ground control points. So basically I made big X's and put a number on them. And then I flew a drone. I flew a DJI Mavic 2, which was a client's drone. I flew it over the entire property through a program called um, Drone Deploy. There's two programs I've used for this, Drone Deploy and Maps Made Easy. And what they do is they use a process called photogrammetry, which is how the majority of the maps in Western Canada and the States were created, where you know where the drone is or the drone knows where the drone is as it's moving throughout the landscape and as it's taking photos. And it also generally knows because of where it took off from the angle of where it's taking those photos. And so it can produce uh, an accurate contour map up to eight centimeters, eight to 10 centimeters, if it's untreed by doing this process. And what we did is because we had trees, we also then went into the landscape, took a bunch of points, and then a colleague of mine, Paper Street Permaculture, Brent Smith, has an amazing algorithm that basically reduced the height of the trees in the places where the data wasn't as, um, as uh, accurate as it could be using the points that we took as reference. So we ended up with a highly accurate map for, I think it was close to $3,000, as opposed to hiring a survey crew to do it, which would have been close to nine. Now, this individual is doing a lot of water harvesting and they needed that level of accuracy. And so we went through that process. So I use that and then that information is, uh, is used to create what's called a digital elevation model which is basically minus trees, we get a sense of the entire landscape. With trees, it's called a digital terrain model. It's kind of like taking a big blanket or a, a thin silk sheet and draping it over the landscape. Generally, that, those kinds of, of models are gonna drape over trees and come down to the ground and there's gonna be some feathering if we looked at it in 3D. But a digital elevation model is us actively getting the ground. I've also hired uh, straight LiDAR drone pilots that have $25,000 drones, they'll fly a property and they'll produce high res uh, LIDAR elevation data. Um, this was in the States and it was much cheaper than it is in Canada. As soon as LIDAR goes prosumer on something like DGI, uh, I think a lot of those guys are going uh, to lose their work. But, and then the, the last piece is if you're looking for map material, I always go to the municipality, type in municipality name, GIS, county name, GIS, uh, call up the municipality, ask them if they have maps, ask them if they're willing to provide me some. I'll also reach out to mining companies, forestry companies to get that data and bring it in. Once I have that DEM, digital elevation model, I can then process it through a program like QGIS, which is free, which I've talked about before. Uh, the Regrarians do an amazing training on QGIS if you're keen on it. It's a high level program. It takes a lot of, of understanding. And generally, because I do most of my thinking about the information I get, I don't keep up on QGIS. I'm not hyper proficient in it. I can do a few things because data is always changing. Information is always changing. Software is always changing. And I don't want to spend my time 
being up to date on a piece of software when I only use it maybe four or five times a year. So instead, I pay somebody else to do it. And I have multiple people in my uh, my guild of practitioners. So if somebody's busy, if, if somebody's doing something, if they're unavailable, I have another person I can switch to. And basically, I have a set standard I can work with that. So once I get the post-processing done, I get a number of different maps. I get a contour map. I get an aspect map, which shows me generally what are all the different surfaces of north, east, south, and west. I get a slope map, which gives me a sense of what uh, percentage of slope am I looking at. I usually get a watts per meter squared, so I get a sense of how much solar energy is per meter square on a site. I will get a one meter, a five, and usually a 10 meter contour map, depending on size and elevation, usually around like 300 to 400 acres, that's generally what I'll get. Um, what are the other ones I usually get? Oh, total water index and total water flow. So this is the nice thing about um, GIS uh, programs like QGIS or ArcGIS or ArcMap. Some of them can do full hydrological flow assessments, which means they can take the entire landscape and they can show how much water is flowing on that landscape and how much water collects. This is amazing if we're doing rainwater harvesting on a big scale, because now we can actually say, oh, wow, I've got, I've got over uh, 4 million uh, liters of water that hypothetically flows down this creek every single year, not all at the same time, but I can then take that water and put it into play. Uh, what didn't I cover in my exposition there, my ranty exposition? Yep, so that, so that. Yeah, so a couple examples, uh, Pearl River Eco Design, United Desires and Regrarians, all of those folks use GIS and um, works really well. Uh, Robin, are you on this call? And did you have anything you wanted to add or does that answer your question? Um, yeah, no, I, I thought it was useful to bring up like um, from the beginning, knowing what um, we're actually looking for, what level of detail we require based on our intentions and goals. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Um, you know, when we get to urban sites or we get to like sub half acre sites, unless there's a big watershed above us, I don't, I don't usually engage in that process. It's really when we're taking a look at large scale land design. We're taking a look at water storage. We're taking a look at tree placement. We're taking a look at animal movement, um, shelter belts, thing of, things of that nature. Because when you get to this work, and I use, I use a number of tools. I think we talked about this before. I'm not a capital P permaculturalist. I don't show up to somebody's house and they're like, oh, the permaculturalist has arrived. I show up to somebody's house and I'm a land designer and permaculture is a tool in my tool belt. And it's a, uh, you know, it's a pair of glasses I put on that like these glasses have a tint. Um, and I see, I see the world a little differently. And especially when you get into key line design, you see the world dramatically differently. And the key line scale of permanence for all things agricultural is an incredible tool because basically what PA did is he said, climate rules of the game, topography, the board game, water, the number one element we need in the game of this land design process. And again, I've talked about this before, but the agrarians took PA Yeoman's work of key line design, turned it and amalgamated it into the agrarians platform. Fantastic course, highly recommend the Rex, which is their online uh, course for anybody who wants to go into large scale land design and wants to do productive large scale land design. Fantastic. Great community. You'll be in like minded designers. Uh, really good stuff. But that key line scale of permanence uh, for all things agricultural really gives you a sense of what you should focus on first. And that's why right at the beginning of this course, climate, we're talking about climate, and then we're talking about topography, and then we're talking about water. We're really trying to get that into your mindset. And Jeff Lawton um, took that as well, you know, a water access structure. Uh, this was his distilling of the Keyline scale of permanence to say, well, water first and foremost, but water is dependent on topography and topography is dependent on climate. So skipping a couple of steps and then access, how are we going to get in? If we can't access it, if we can't maintain it, it'll be a problem. And I will make a pitch now when you are designing, when you are placing plants in the landscape, you need to be able to access them. If you have all these circles together, you cannot access that design. The number one problem designers make when they put in designs is they put things too close. Number one problem. If you put a number of support plants or what's called chaperone plants, if you put a bunch of nitrogen fixers in there or pioneers and you know you're going to cut them out 
and they're going to feed the rest of the system. I do this a lot with alders. Alders are nitrogen fixing trees that are pioneers um, and take, take quite a bit of abuse, quite a bit of pruning because they're pioneers, they're built that way. I will cut alders during the bloom, and this is true for all legumes, during the bloom is when their nitrogen potential is at the highest. So when you cut, when you till under legumes, say you're using a cover crop, say you're using a pigeon pea or a pilgrim pea or you know clover, when they're in bloom, that's the highest nitrogen potential. Once they put all of their work into seed, now that nitrogen has moved into the plant and has usually been taken up to create that seed. So I will, especially in tree crops, I'll use alders as chaperones as well as nitrogen fixation and I'll cut down those alders on a continual basis to feed the rest of the system. All that from a GIS question. <laughs> okay, uh, Jonas, is it okay to perform the above ground percolation test with a seven inch can? Jonas, are you on the call? Bum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. No, Jonas, you are not. Okay, I'm gonna answer this in a way that I hope I can get it. So we have what's called percolation test and an infiltration test. And one, if you go back to, or if you haven't looked yet, go to the, the soil instructions and go to the assignments and go to the percolation test. One is above ground and you're using a can basically. And uh, a one gallon pot is, is, uh, is recommended only because there's a certain volume of, 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 of water and it gives us a certain rate that we can then transpose. Um, so if you're above ground percolation test and you're using a chopped off bottom of a, of a pot to give you a sense of, of what that infiltration rate is, yeah, it's fine. A seven inch can, I think would be fine if that's what you mean. Does the, uh, the long grass have to be cleared before the water is added? So yeah, if we're talking about, um, uh, uh, in infiltration, um, or if we're talking about percolation, yeah. Cause what we're trying to do is we're trying to see how well does the water uh, infiltrate, pardon me, um, percolate into the parent material. So this is getting a little ahead of ourselves. Basically, when you look at soil, we have the O horizon, A horizon, B horizon. O horizon is organics. O horizon is organics. And so we move off the organics to get a sense of, okay, if I ever saturate my soil, what then will the parent material do of the soil? And I have to explain a few concepts here. One is called field capacity and one is called saturation. Water works on what's called capillary action. Capillary action is dependent upon two forces. One is called adhesion and one is called cohesion. So adhesion is the ability for water to hold to other surfaces. And so if you've ever had a cup and you've been pouring the cup or volume of liquid out of a cup and it is holding to the side of the cup, that means that adhesion, adhesion is adding the water, that's how I remember it, is adding the water or holding the water to another surface. And basically adhesion is surface tension and it's more powerful than gravity. This is the cool thing about this work. It's more powerful than gravity. So being more powerful than gravity means that adhesion holds that to uh, other material. So water's ability to hold itself to soil, adhesion. Cohesion is the ability for water to hold itself to itself. So adhesion and cohesion together make capillary action and capillary or capillary action is the ability um, for the water to move throughout the soil. And that is dependent on surface area. So basically what we're doing in a percolation and infiltration test is we are getting a sense of what is the total surface area within all the little tiny particles within the soil. And if you think of it this way, sand is gigantic at a microscopic scale. It's like this big, right? Silt is very tiny. It's like this big. Clay is like a little tiny flake. And it is, it's, it's, it's a flake with a top and a bottom positively and negatively charged. Now, if you have a big sand ball, right? Kind of think like a big exercise ball, it'll have a surface area. But if you fill that sand ball with a whole bunch of silt, well, that silt has its own surface area. And the way I used to teach this was, it's kind of like a two drawer filing cap. On the outside of that two drawer filing cabinet, if you think of like the top as being a square and the bottom as being a square, you have one, two side, uh, three, four, other side, five, six, backside, seven, eight, top and bottom, Nine ten. So if we think of 
that filing drawer and that square, you have 10 units of surface area. Well, if we put in 100 file folders into each of those, and each of those file folders also has that surface area, and you have 200 file folders, and each file folder has one, two, three, four sides. So now we have 400 units of surface area as opposed to 10 units of surface area. And then if we put 10 sheets of paper in every single one of those file folders, well, now we have two sides on each of that, that's 20. We have 10 in each one, that's 200 per file folder. We have 100 file folders per piece. Well, you know, now we're looking at 4,000 units of surface area. So when we are pouring water either on top of our O horizon to get a sense of how much is the O horizon absorbing, or we remove the O horizon and putting it on the parent soil and going into and seeing how much of that soil will absorb. We're getting a sense of the surface area ability or the surface area quantity, I guess, of that soil to absorb water and then its ability to uh, drain water. Because as you go down particle size, clay holds on to that water because it's so small and because adhesion and cohesion and capillary reaction hold on to uh, hold on to water and we know this you know just colloquially or commonly clay holds a lot of water and because those particle sizes are smaller than the rootlets of plants plants can't always get that water and because clay holds water so well you can create bucket effects especially if you plant a tree into clay soil and you don't interface with the soil well if it rains, you can actually fill up the hole even though it's totally filled with soil because the clay isn't going to absorb that water as fast as the very porous material of the tree. So again, very long answer to say, yes. <laughs> Remove the O horizon to get the parent soil and then conduct percolation test. Does it matter if the soil is already moist from rain? Yeah, it'll give you what's called a wet percolation rate. So if it's already wet, you get a sense of how much more water you can add to it. And this is really important in terms of duration. So if we have very sandy soil and we wet it, we know that the water will infiltrate quickly, but it also drain quickly. So that means we're probably going to do less water more often. If we take a look at silt uh, soils or loamy soils, well, now we can do heavy waterings and we know it'll hold and we don't have to do it as much. And with clay, clay is difficult. Uh, you put too little, it doesn't absorb. You put too much, it runs off. Um, and it becomes saturated. So all of that comes into play in terms of how we do our watering scheduling. And the last thing I wanted to say is that when it comes to um, capillary action and, and, and soil is that we have these last two terms. We have field capacity and we have saturation. Field capacity is when a soil absorbs as much water as it can and still has interstitial airspace. Interstitial airspace is basically the space in between the soil particles called the PEDs, P-E-D-E-S, PEDs. So a soil particle is called a PED, kind of like a molecule, but for soil. And if you take a look at it under a microscope, basically you'll see all of these, these soil particles and there's a film of water around them all, but there's interstitial airspace. Now, the reason why that's important is that these are terrestrial environments. They need air. They're aerobic environments. They need oxygen. They're not anaerobic environments without oxygen. So you need to have air in these environments. Once a soil moves past field capacity and into saturation, now the interstitial airspace is full of water. And now the terrestrial life that is in your soil is dying. Why? They're not aquatic. They're terrestrial. They need air like we need air. And this is important when you're thinking about water and moving water through a landscape because you want to get to field capacity as much as possible because that removes the burden of watering off you, the designer, the maintainer, the gardener, the farmer, the productionist, the rancher, and onto the soil itself. And this is why for us, the soil is the most economical. Uh, it has the most potential. Every percent of organic matter we raise on an acre is something to the order of 20,000 gallons, 80,000 liters. So every percent of organic matter we can raise on an acre is 20,000 gallons, roughly 80,000 liters. And this has been retested over and over and over again. Rodale's done a bunch of tests on it. Um, a number of university extensions have done it, but this holds true. 1% of organic matter increased on an acre. We have about 20,000 gallons, 80,000 liters. Usually when we're installing rainwater tanks, you can think a buck a liter, um, although recently with, with what's happening in the state of the world, we've seen costs 
sometimes double or triple for rain tanks. So take that for a way you will. Nicole, great, we talked about that at the beginning. Richard, unfortunately, we'll be able to join the meeting. Okay, but, uh, but apologize. I heard you mention Huga culture. I've watched a few videos on it. I'm very intrigued. I read hardwoods are better than softwoods. I also have lots of ponderosa pine. How does ponderosa pine do for Huga culture? Okay, so I think we talked about this last time. I'm just gonna go over it one more time just so everyone's clear. So say we have a site and this site for whatever reason we want to create more soil. We want to create more water holding capacity. We have a lot of trees to be used. We can work with a process called hookah culture. And hookah culture is the process of digging a trench, putting in a bunch of logs, and then putting the soil that came out of the trench back over the mound. This then decomposes, becomes soil. And at the same time, if you've ever been walking out in nature and come across a nurse log, a tree that has fallen in the forest, has decomposed, chances are you've seen that it has a lot of surface area. And if it has a lot of surface area, it can absorb a lot of moisture. And if you've ever been walking in, um, in rain environments, rain, rain forests, you'll find that when you step into these logs and they're really decomposed, your foot goes through and it comes out sopping wet because this tree has now become a sponge, a literal sponge, for water. The other thing it does is that it decomposes and de decomposition creates a bit of heat because of the organisms and their biological factors and their, their processes within that decomposition. So what we have here is a self-watering, slightly self-heating, microclimate creating garden bed. And it was popularized by Sepp Holzer. Uh, he learned it from others as well, but hygge culture means mound cultivation. So this is mound cultivation. And actually, I just did an amazing interview with a gentleman who was a student in, I don't know if it was last course or the course before, but he found a farmer in Rossland, Andrew Bennett, amazing, amazing farmer. And Andrew was soliciting woody debris from the town of Rossland in British Columbia. He had dug a massive trench and they were coming in and filling it. And once it was all filled, he then put the soil back on top and used it to grow. This was so interesting to Dan, Dan Tatham, who's an industrial designer who used to live up in Powell River, which is on the west coast of British Columbia. He went to the local regional district and he saw that they were doing this big project, this big reclamation project. And he said, hey, I think we can use this in this project. And so they created 80 meter by 20 meter hygge cultures using all of the woody debris on site and put it into play. So that's hygge culture. Building hygge culture, couple of rules of thumb. First and foremost, you want wood that's decomposing. First and foremost, you want wood that's decomposing. Can you put in live wood? Yes. Should you be, when you're starting off, should you be cautious about that? Yes. What you want to do is you want to use decomposing wood. Why? Because you know it's already decomposing and the biocides that naturally occur in woods, especially barks, have, uh, have, are no longer there or gone. And this means, especially because most trees have about a week to two weeks dissipation for their fungicides and biocides in their bark, that gives you the chance to dissipate that. In the case of some trees, like alder, red oaks, or dogwood, and willow, these are trees, not, all, not, not only these trees, but a lot of pioneer trees can be, can be live staked, which means you can cut down a willow, cut down an alder or a branch, you can dig a hole in the ground and stick it in the ground at a time when there's a lot of rainfall and it'll completely regrow as a tree. We did this by creating an instant privacy hedge. We took a massive willow that was upright, chopped it down, created a big trench, put it in that trench, pulled up its branches now, put little rocks at the bottom to hold it up, put all the soil back on, it completely regrew. We had an instant hedge, instant. And we were a little cheeky. We put it underneath a power line so that way the local power company would come by and, and trim the hedge. Little cheeky, I admit it, worked out great. The deer got to it, they loved it as well. So you have to be careful about the type of woods you put into hygge culture because you wanna make sure they are dead. Other thing to consider, cedar, juniper, um, persistently non-rotting trees like rowan trees and, and, um, and black hawthorn, if they don't rot. If they have volatile oils, it will be very hard for them to decompose if they haven't already been exposed to a lot of the terrestrial organisms that have been decomposing them. So this is why for me, I usually put my, my wood aside on year one, 
wait for a couple of years or a year or two, and then put it, uh, put it back in. I'll draw this out for folks. I don't think I have a, a photo readily available, but I have a shop um, right beside my house. And the shop sheds about 30,000 liters a year for my precept off one side. And I had this area right here that I was really interested to grow in. So what I did is I dug like a big capital E. So you can think about like a big capital E here. And what I did is I put, actually this is all the way out, is I put this trench right under the drip line of the shop. You know what I'm gonna, yeah, there we go. Right underneath the shop. So basically water sheds here, drops here. And basically all of this got filled with a bunch of wood, including ponderosa pine, because that's what I have in my, my area as well. So there was all of these, these logs underneath and it came and mounted up. Then I took my soil, put it back over these three um, areas, let it sit for a year. I didn't worry about growing anything in it year one. This year during the heat dome, we got above 52 degrees Celsius. It was one of the hottest places in British Columbia. I didn't water this once this year, not once. I watered when I transplanted to make sure that the, the plants were good. That was it. I grew all of my squash in these three beds, this, or two beds. I actually didn't use this, this southerly bed. These two beds, I grew all my squash in this year. I grew my kombucha squash. I grew my uh, velvet orange squash. I grew my butternuts. I grew my, my black forest. Grew them all here. So hugo cultures can be fantastic if placed well and hopefully folks are picking this up without me seeing it, saying it if they're fed water it's really important to have them in a place that water can feed them water can can feed what they need and if you go to my website and you look at the fire prevention pond and hugo culture the way that uh design was worked is that we had this pond so if this is looking over top we oh boop, 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 boop. There we go. Um, we had this drawing. Oh, pardon me. Um, we had this. Well, you know what I'm going to do? That's weird. My annotation is not working. <coughs> <coughs> oh, there we go. And you know what I might do? I might just roll down so I get a big screen. Uh, so we had this drainage that was coming in, and what we needed, we, this is a bit of a valley. So if we give, a, give some contours here, so this is low contour, this is high contour, this is high contour. So let's say 10, 20, 30. What we did is we built a dam and this is with um, Eco Element Design, Gord Hebert and Jana McNabb. They're no longer doing this work anymore. I think it came up to this, these two contours, yeah. And what ended up happening is this would back flood all the way back to here. We had all this dirt and we had a whole lot of trees we took down. So on the fly, I suggested, well, we should build a hoogle on this backside. So we laid all the trees down this way in a big trench. And you'll notice that we wicked this hoogle where the water was coming from. And then we came back in with soil and we covered it up. And so we covered this all up with soil. And then she replanted on top here to actually create more of a shelter belt because we want to make sure that wind doesn't come across our ponds uh, in great quantity. A little bit of wind's great because it does aerate it. So this was replanted. And this became her nut nursery where she just planted, fenced, and this worked phenomenally well. Last time I checked in, it was just going really, really well. Okay. Cool. There we go. So I'm going to pop back up here to the first. And uh, Richard Hugo culture. Okay. This is a monstrous question. Um, my neighbor and I just came to upon an opportunity to have a lot of dirt dumped into our properties for free. Uh, graded any way we like, which I was discussing with my father-in-law. I would like to flatten out as much as possible and also use the opportunity to cut down a lot of trees to the west side of the property, but leaves trees 
along the property perimeter for privacy is viewing, viewing the additional dirt mainly from the perspective of added property, property value. Just take a moment and look at how this question is laid out and look at the bolded highlighting. How easy is this to read? Like it, it doesn't take any effort. We both agreed to have three terraces of dirt created along the south end of the, the site, gardening, water retention ponds, and perhaps panels. And windbreak thought out design project, is this a well-founded concern or not? I'm worried about that, that they'll have a deforestation effect, right? Um, here we have slightly different version, visions of the property. We both want to design to be self-sufficient, resilient, but are approaching from different perspectives. He's open to having other perspectives. I want to make sure we maximize the potential for forest, food forest, water retention, and some livestock. What are your thoughts and suggestions here? So my first, <coughs> my first reaction is never make a decision that may affect your grandchildren under pressure. And the way that he's approaching this, and I'm just going to bring up um, his work here. So uh, we've got his assignment here. And we've got our base map again. And he's talking about this area here. And so he, he's provided another area to say, proposed terraces, flattening a tree, tree removal. So we've got three areas that they're proposing to do this in. So one, I never make a decision under duress ever, especially when it comes to landscape. We've got seven generations coming up. If I can think it out, and if I can think it out to the point to where I have no pressure from it, great, I will do so. If there's pressure, no, I'm, I'm just gonna give myself the window I need to make a decision that feels right and doesn't feel rushed and doesn't feel frustrated. So with that said, there's a couple of concerns I have about this idea. One, he's putting in, or he's, he's putting in terms of order of operation, he's not even done his evaluation of his site and already he's going, okay, great, we're gonna change it. What happens when you put in terraces is an important piece to understand. When you put in terraces, you regrade a landscape so that way it becomes a stepped structure, right? When it's stepped, now all of a sudden we have a surface of water that, or a, a surface of area that will now have a surface of water that comes into it. If the terraces aren't created correctly, depending on what <clears throat> the subsoil is, that water can saturate, we now know that word, can saturate this terrace and can actually delaminate if there's bedrock, if there's a hard pan, if there's a big clay material, it can actually delaminate and it can shift and move as, as all earthworks do. Terraces generally are great ideas. Um, usually I'll do what's called backgrading a terrace. And so when you're backgrading a terrace, that means that if we've got a slope like this, what I'll do is I'll come back in. And when I make these terraces, I will backgrade them which means that instead of doing them flat, I'll do them slightly back graded. So that way when they're created, <clears throat> if water falls, they actually become something of a swale. And this is something as well that Sepp did really well in the Kromatterhof. I think he has like 90 ponds, 70 ponds, something like that, and hundreds of terraces that basically switch back and forth and back and forth up and down his property. The big question is, what is the objectives for this property? And does this terrace actually bring about the objectives they're wanting? So at this point, I don't think the objectives are clear enough in the property. And I don't know if they're necessary. Uh, yes, I think they're interested in fruit trees. Yes, I think they're interested in processing trees. But generally speaking, and you know, looking at his flat area, he has a lot of flat area to work with. And we'll go back to um, the base map that has a scale. So he's got a hundred feet here. And so we've got like 50 by 75 feet here. We've got like a hundred feet by probably 50 at its widest. There's a lot of area here. And this is generally a flat area. I would probably, if this were me, I'd probably be focusing on potentially just doing um, our gardening here in terms of our annual food production. And then, yeah, if we were thinking about working with some kind of uh, terracing, I would. I would look back here and see if I could terrace. But I would be very wary about bringing in off soil site, especially or off site soil, especially if we don't need it. So, questions I would have about this is how deep is my soil here? Have I ever brought in an excavator and done a full test pit? Uh, what does my soil look like? Uh, because every time you bring soil from off-site, you're bringing a different biome onto your site. There's a different genetic bank, different seed bank. There's potentially pathogen that comes in from it. If it's just parent material, less so. 
But then you get into, as we talked about before, in terms of the different soil sizes, you get into what's called a soil texture interface problem. So <clears throat> if the soil on site is smaller particle size, which means it has higher surface area, and if the broader material has larger particle size, which means it has less surface area, chances are what will happen is that material, if it's on top as a terrace, will have to get to saturation before the material below it will accept any water because at saturation, gravity starts to work on that water. So I would caution against this without really thinking it through and getting a sense of it. I would get as much time on the back end as possible. Hey, can we wait a little while? Um, if somebody has a machine and they're willing to work for free, you definitely have to take advantage of that. Totally get that. But this is also a very flat area. And so <clears throat> I just went back before and I didn't really see that there was a great photo that, that really captured this. This is eight. And eight is looking back towards the volleyball court. So yeah, so we have generally a slope here, but specifically this area here, and I'm just gonna zoom in. There we go. <clears throat> but generally this area here actually isn't capturing these photos. So I'm still um, attempting to understand this site. Um, what I could imagine is if he went ahead and did a cross section early. So Richard, if you're watching this, um, if you did a cross section here early and here early, you could get a sense of earth moved. I would also go do a test pit. Um, those are some of the things I would do first and foremost before evaluating this. And Richard, feel free to continue to bring this up in our conversations uh, for the assignments or if you want to reach out, um, please do. So those are some of the things I'd be thinking about in this. Um, dum, dum, dum. What are some ways I can find out that the dirt has been treated with chemicals and safeguarding? So uh, laboratory test in Canada, I use a &L laboratories and in the US, I'm just gonna bring up this. I was just looking for it. Uh, there's two laboratories that a brilliant colleague of mine uses in the States. Yeah, here we go. Um, Ward Lab is very good. Ward Lab and then Regen Egg Lab as well. That was founded by a former Ward Lab uh, agronomist, especially like if you're looking for chemicals and then if you're looking for uh, soil food web, which is getting a sense of the number of organisms <clears throat> that are in the soil. This is, includes the bacteria and fungal ratio and then the protozoa, protozoa nematode and microarthropods. They're good as well. <clears throat> if there's still time, I mentioned I'm learning to read a contour map and I have a contour map of my site surrounding my area, warding. Do you mind highlighting how you look at these maps? Yeah, absolutely happy to do this. So I already pre-downloaded this. Oh, I see that there's a chat. Down the crystal. Do you have to dig a trench or can you build a berm? Oh, for Hoogles. Um, yeah, you can build a, you can you can build up. You can totally do that. The thing about building down with a Hoogle is that it gives you a subsurface water collection site. Um, and it really helps to create like a coral reef for soil organisms. That's a great question. Thanks for that. Sorry, I didn't see that before. Okay, we're gonna run a little long if you have to go. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks time. And uh, thanks for everybody's assignments. If you want to stick around for bonus time, I will pull up this contour map and I'll go through how I would decode this landscape. I love decoding contour maps. So if I get giddy, I'm in my zone. <laughs> And may we all find Nerdvana together. It's all about being geeky and nerdy. Okay, <clears throat> so here's our site. And I'm going to move my annotation tools a little bit to the top so I can see this fully. And I'm gonna move my ugly mug there, I guess. Well, maybe someplace else. Real estate, real estate, real estate. Okay, there we go. 
So <clears throat> when you start with a topographic map, this is not just a topographic map, this is also called hill, shot, uh, hill shade relief or relief map. And what that means is that uh, there's been a computer program that's run this contour or somebody has physically gone in and they've given us a bit of a sense of the shape of this. So our eye can see it by giving us a bit of shading. Um, areas that are quite shaded are more steep. Areas that are less shaded are quite uh, flat. So hill shaded maps are great. You might see these in uh, backwoods or backcountry road maps or hiking maps. If you've ever done any orienteering, um, these are the maps that I grew up with in Boy Scouts because I was indeed a Boy Scout for many years. Um, so looking at this, uh, there's a couple of things to, to, to just take a look at. Roads are usually double lines. Um, and usually a single line is left to writing. And uh, that idea of using a single line is usually not used because it can be so ubiquitous. And that's something really important to carry over into your design maps. So we have double lines for roads. We've got dotted lines for streams and, um, and different types of water flows. Green is usually forested. And, uh, and what else am I seeing here? We've got bodies of water and then we've got elevation lines. Now, he hasn't provided me a legend for this, but he's uh, in America. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to assume that this is an imperial and it's in feet. And so as I take a look at this, um, whenever I take a look at a, a landscape, I'm looking for high points first. So if you take a look at your hand, we're gonna have the handscape conversation. If you take a look at your hand, this is generally the form and function we see the world over. We usually see a ridge or we see isolated ridges and there's a high point. So the top of our hand is the highest point there. You can kind of see it. You know, if I was to take my phone and I was gonna use that as a contour, you would see that that point is higher than everything else. If I move my head, it's probably even a little bit. Yeah, there you go. You can see that it's higher. And then this next one is a little bit lower and then this one and then this one. Now, this is the great thing about ridges the world over. They do, they do that stepped conversation. Um, there are some individuals who have been purporting that uh, there's uh, same elevation heights in the world, and um, that's wrong. But similarly, when we're going into this work, we're looking at high points, and we're also looking at ridges. So, of course, the top of my finger is going to be a ridge and a ridge and a ridge, and in between my finger is going to be valleys. So we've got uh, the high points, right? We have uh, top summits, if you will. We have little saddles in between my uh, fingers. We have valleys and we have ridges. And that's what we're seeing here. Everything you need to understand a contour map is in your hand. Because if you ended up, I wonder if I have a pen here. We've all gone so digital. I don't know if I have a pen. Let me see if I got one, hold on. Enough, I don't have a pen. But if I did, what we would do is we would draw all the contours on here and we would end up with a contour map that we could read that would look just like this. I wish I had a, I'll do this next time in the, uh, in the office hours, I'll, I'll do the handscape. But if that makes sense to you, you can then start to decode a landscape. So decoding landscapes for me goes like this. Hey, look, a high point. Hey, look, a high point. Uh, bu, 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 bu. Hey, look, a high point. Oh, hey, look, a high point. Cool. So that's generally what I'm seeing here. Oh, another high point over here, another high point over here. So these are tops. These are tops of the roofs, and they're isolated tops of the roofs. So this high point here, you know, this contour line here is never going to interact with any rain that falls down here because it's higher, right? It's peaked higher. So these are all tops. These are all the tops of my knuckles, if you will. And then as you're looking at this, they've already given you a bit of the information in terms of drainages. So as we look down, we know that we have our drainages that run down here and our drainages that run down here, and our drainages that run down 
here and then spread. So this is interesting. This is a saddle. So this is coming down a ridge and then pops up to another little summit, if you will, and then comes down here. So this water comes down quite acutely here. And then you start to see as we're getting closer to his site that we've got this bigger watershed. Now, again, we've got a ridge here. So our ridge stop starts up here and comes all the way down. And then there's another one that starts up here and comes all the way down. And there's one that comes all the way down here. And there's one that comes down here. And then there'd be another valley here. And then there's one that starts here. Now, this one's important because as we take a look at his site, this ends up becoming a dividing line. Again, this is the top of the roof. Ridges are tops of roofs. And so the water that falls onto this area is gonna divide this way or this way. It's gonna go this way, or it's gonna go this way. That gives us a sense of what we're looking at. So if we come back to his site, I can already tell, and this is great because this really tells us quite a bit about his site. His site is on a ridge. This is a dry place. This is a place that doesn't get a lot of water. This means anything we can do to bring more water to the site is of value. So I'm gonna zoom in now. Oh, maybe I won't. There we go. Thank you. I'm gonna clear my big understanding and now we're into our small understanding. So here we have a couple of, of interesting conversations. We have this, this watershed that comes in here. Uh, pardon me, this, this flow. Now, if this is the flow that on his site, I think, I'm not sure, but I think is this. I'm go back to his base mount. I'll say this, I hope it's this, because <laughs> if it is, he has access to quite a bit of water. And if it isn't, then it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. We get the places we do. Cool. So if this dotted line here is that same dotted line we're seeing on the big map, that means that when we go back to that big map, I'm going to now be very curious about what feeds this area. Because this area here has a potential larger watershed. So if we zoom out from this, actually, I think what I might do is I might draw directly on the map instead of using the... Um, Annotate. Where's my draw tool? Ah, oh, there we go. There's my scrubber. Oh, hello. Um, nice. <laughs> so if this comes up here, what I want to do is be careful and be aware that it's going to have a drain and we see this here. So this drains all the way down here, but I want to know, oh, yeah, maybe like that, but I want to know what feeds this. So to do that, I would have to then turn back over to my assessment of bridges and drainages. Oh, no, I don't want that. Blue and a new one. Okay. So in this, now we're going to start to think about, well, where are my ridges? So here's a ridge, kind of like so. And here's a ridge up here. And basically, all the water above this is going to come down this way. Oh, that's interesting. And then all the water to this ridge that's over here, that obviously was poorly rendered by the computer. Which is very common for computers. This ridge is going to, you know, right about there, is going to fall this way. So what I have is between this area and this area, and we start to see, yeah, so this water will all flow down here. And here's another ridge. So we have another ridge here that we can see. And it takes time to learn this, it takes time to be comfortable with this. What I can say is you should absolutely get into the habit of doing quite a bit of drawing with contours um, and just playing with this process because it does take time. And then 
this comes down here-ish. Probably something like this, I imagine. Something like this. So if we take a look at this water, and if we, again, think about the fact that water flows at right angle to contour, so if we zoom in here, we now have the boundaries of the top of this watershed. So we have this area. Let's over to the other drawing tool so I can pull up my arrows. And then with arrows, we can start to get a sense of right around here, when does this, this watershed, when does this watershed stop? And I'm gonna remove this one. Oh, I'm gonna go back over here. Get rid of that. So where does this watershed stop? Well, anything below this contour isn't going to affect him because this is on the same contour. And if we start taking a look at our, our arrow set and we go, yeah, water flows at right angle to contour. So it's gonna flow like this, it's gonna flow like this, depending on if these roads change, changes that material. And we can take a look, let's say that his, his site is something Again, I'm just wondering if this is, is the case because the road is kind of connected to his house and whatnot. So if this is the case and this is his actual site, we'll take the lowest part of his site and then we'll draw up in terms of what our watershed boundary looks like. So right angle to contour is, oh, that is a square. Right angle to contour is something like this. Because again, water flows at right angle to contour, but it includes all of this, includes all of this, and includes everything that flows into this drainage as well. And then probably comes out a bit and includes this. So this is actually the extra credit water assignment that uh, you'll be getting into. But when I look at this, this is the area that I'd be most curious about. I'd be curious if there are farms up here. I'd be curious if there's, um, any types of agriculture that might be affecting this, this site. And truthfully, I don't know if anybody caught this, but my, uh, my drawing tool was actually a little, I was blocked by the toolbar. So actually it would go up here. So ignore this line. Of course you can't just erase certain portions in Zoom. So that means all of this is our watershed. This is our watershed that comes into it. So this is how I end up decoding landscapes and getting a sense of, well, where are all the areas and what am I seeing? And how does this look? If there's any questions about this, I'd be happy to take a question or two about how to decode these landscapes. If this makes sense, if this doesn't make sense, if you do have a question, you can put it in the chat bar, just raise your hand or not raise your hand, just um, um, demute yourself, unmute yourself. There we go, there's the other one. Makes sense. Can you hear me? I can. Cool. Sorry, I had to get back to work. Um, but this is what I this is what I processed this morning. Okay. Trying to figure out where I was on the watershed. And so um I work for a nursery guys. And so I'm finding out that I'm at the top of these plateaus. So it's very important that we do regenerative work for the overall watershed as a whole. Um, since we're, we're sitting up at the top of one of those ridges. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which means that your quote unquote roof that you might draw water from is reduced. So this is where I get excited about roads that are boundarying properties because you might be able to take some of that road, ditches, anything like that, or potentially access on contour from something else that's further afield. So all of that, are or all of those elements are potential water sources you can pull from depending on regulation depending on relationship depending on skill uh, but i love that it sounds like you're you're processing that really well nicole bravo thank you any other questions before we take off folks anything else that can help to evaluate what we were talking about today i'm just going to check and go back to the question nope we're all good all right, folks, super, uh, super great to see everybody. I hope the course is going well for folks. I haven't heard from many of you that there are problems, so I'm going to think that's great. If you do need one-on-one -on -one help, reach out. I've been having a couple of Zoom meetings for folks that are frustrated or discouraged. Remember, this isn't a rendering course. I've, I've worked with high-level designers that have been doing this for 40 years, and they work with crayons. I'm serious. 
when we, when we go to Uganda, when we go to Kenya, we do designs in dirt, you know, and, and sometimes overdeveloped individuals and in petroleum nations get really worked up that they don't know how to make the pixels look good. Don't worry about it. It's just, it's, it's a pixel, it's a pixel thing. Like, don't worry about it. Find a way to render that works for you during this course. The most important work that happens in this work is between the ears. This is the climate of the mind we're trying to change. This is the climate we're trying to change, not out there, but inside our head. We're trying to look at a landscape in a way that goes, oh, the sun matters and water matters and the soil matters. And those animals that come through in a migrating pattern matter, not this pixel isn't the way I want it. Don't worry about the pixel. If you can't make it work, reach out to me. I'm unfortunately really good at Google Slides. It's a program I never thought I would ever be as good as and as I am today. But what's amazing about it, and this is this is my pitch for it, Anybody can pick it up, anybody can learn it, anybody can put something together that looks really quite professional and can pass it on to a client and say, here, here's my ideas, here's the reasoning behind my ideas, here's what I would do. Or you can hybrid, grab a piece of paper, grab transparency, work with grid paper, use pencil and pen, and just draw it out. And if your printing is, isn't great, like mine isn't, great, draw everything out and then bring it into Google Slides and then type out your words. Like just work with what the way that it works for you. And we're all going to get there in the end. You don't have to suffer alone. Please reach out if you have any problems. It's been such a pleasure to see everybody's designs. And um, yeah, thanks. Really, really love these sessions and looking forward to the next time we meet in a couple of weeks. Any questions, comments, queries? It's good times? All right. Sweet folks, thanks so much for your time. And uh, this will be up in a couple of days time. Take care.